Hello and welcome to Sweetwater. I'm Mason Marangella from Vertex Effects, AKA The Rig Doctor. You may have seen some of our videos where we cover pedal board best practices. And today we're gonna help you figure out which is the best buffer for your pedal board. A buffer is basically a one-to-one -one amplifier. It's supposed to represent whatever comes into it on the output of it, converting it to low impedance so that it can drive a strong signal between your guitar pedals and all the way back to your amplifier. Now, one of the complications with having a buffer in your system is that any pedal that's turned on after a buffer or any pedal that has a buffer in it after a buffer is actually going to take over for the buffer that comes before it. Let's say, for example, I have a real high quality buffer like the Mesa Boogie Highwire. I've invested a good amount of my budget in getting a high quality buffer, but then I use, let's say, a compressor right after it that I always leave on. Well, that high quality buffer is really only then buffering the patch cable that connects my Mesa Boogie high wire to my compressor, which is always on. And because it's an always on pedal, whether it's true bypass or not, that now becomes my buffer on the pedal board from that point forward until I either one, hit another buffered pedal or two, turn another pedal on, and then that pedal will become the buffer from that point forward. Now, this may not sound so bad if you got other pedals that are buffering in your system, However, a buffer is not a buffer is not a buffer. They are not all created equal and the quality of your buffer really matters. And because our input buffer is sometimes going to be stopped at different points in the signal path because we have other buffered pedals or other pedals that we're turning on and off, which we should be doing, it's our, it's our pedal board, we need to ensure that not only do we have an input buffer, but we also have an output buffer, it means one at the very end of the signal path so that you're able to mitigate any issues on the pedal board because not every pedal is going to be as good of quality as the buffer on your input if you have a high quality one like the Mesa Boogie, for example and it may not have as good a quality buffer on the output. So you want to try to control everything on the pedal board by essentially creating a hardware firewall using the input buffer to control everything with the guitar going into the system and then controlling the pedal board separately from the amplifier by having a buffer on the output of the system. Now I have a few great buffers that are available right here at Sweetwater and I want to take you through a couple of different versions of these buffers where you might consider putting them, contingencies where you may not want to use a buffer, and then what happens if you're going to use a stereo rig or what are you going to do if you have an effects loop and what's the appropriate way to buffer your system utilizing the best practices and getting your rig sounding as close to your guitar plugging straight in with nothing in between as possible even though you may be running through 10 or 20 pedals. So when you're thinking about buffers, there's a couple important things to keep in mind to kind of help you evaluate, well, what is the actual quality and how efficient is this buffer in doing its job of recreating the sound of your guitar plugged directly in your amp with nothing in between? I like to think about two different specs. The first spec is the input impedance. The other spec is the output impedance. These numbers are something that should be associated with every single buffer that you're looking at, and most manufacturers are publishing this information in their manual, so you can always consult it there to make sure that you're getting a buffer that is actually gonna do the job that you're hiring it to do when you purchase it. So the input impedance spec that you wanna look at if you're talking about guitar is gonna be one meg, and that's usually abbreviated by one and then the letter M for meg ohms. The output impedance, you want it to be really as low as possible, but generally a good spec might be somewhere right around 100 ohms. So this is somewhere between maybe 100, maybe up to about 200, but preferably as close to zero as you can get it, the better it's gonna be. Now there's some ways to kind of cheat this a little bit, and you might see some great buffers that are a little higher than that, and you might see some bad buffers that actually show up a little lower than that. So there are some tricks to that, but I think the basic kind of baseline that you wanna kind of think about when you're looking at specs for buffers one meg input for guitar, a 100 ohm output. Now, if you have a bass, this is a little bit different because bass amplifiers have a different input impedance than a guitar amplifier does. The reason why we're choosing one meg, as I said on our guitar buffers, is because that's what 99.9% .9 of the input impedances are on any amplifier. And if we want our guitar pickups to behave as though they're plugged into an amplifier, we have to be able to simulate that loading on the pickups. 
But with the bass, it's a different thing. Whether you're looking at Aguilar, you're looking at SVT and Ampeg and all those different things. For bass, it's a different input impedance. And you wanna go a little higher than that. I would say no lower than 2.2 megs and probably as high up to 10 megs would all be sort of an acceptable range for bass. But on the output impedance, you wanna match it just like the guitar going as close to zero as possible. But realistically, somewhere between 100, 150, maybe as high up as 250 ohms and the output impedance and you'll be just fine. So let's look at some of the offerings that we have here. We have some from MXR and Custom Audio Electronics. Again, if you know anything about this, this is uh, kind of the lineage of Robert Bradshaw, who's kind of one of the pioneers of the guitar pedal board and rack scene going as far back as the 1980s. We have a Mesa Boogie Stowaway, which is an individual just output buffer, as is the one made by MXR. We have the Lely Sunday Driver, which is an excellent choice, especially for you bass players out there that want to buffer your signal path. We're going to talk why this is a good one for that in, in just a minute. And then we have the Mesa Boogie High Wire, which is one of my favorites because it actually incorporates the input buffer and the output buffer in one box. And so you can actually patch it into your signal path exactly in the places that you need it. And you can also use it as a hub for your your entire rig, plus it has a level compensation if you're using different output pickups, and it has a boost and a mute switch. So lots of different cool things that are going on here. And I'm also going to be mentioning the Laylee P-Split here, also for the context of using a stereo rig, but we're gonna get into that in just a second. So let's look at the MXR buffer. I really like this because it is a budget-oriented buffer. It is just an output buffer. However, if you use one of these guys up front, it does meet the spec criteria of the one meg input impedance. So it will control your guitar loading of your pickups the way that you need it to be controlled by having this as your input buffer. Now the output impedance of this is a little bit higher than I like. This is at 1K, which is like a thousand ohms instead of a hundred ohms. So it's a little high for what I like. However, if you're gonna be using pedals on your pedal board, and presumably if you're using a buffer, you are, you're probably not gonna to have to go too far before your buffer is gonna be overridden anyway. And you really just wanna focus on that input buffer on controlling the pickup loading, which this is gonna do just fine for your rig. And it is a great price point for somebody who needs to get an input buffer for their system. Next, we have another favorite of mine, the Mesa Boogie Stowaway. Essentially what it is, is a disaggregated version of the high wire where they're taking one of the buffers out of it and making it as its own individual buffer. Now again, this is just an output buffer. It's not doing two buffers like the high wire, but it also has the same spec as the high wire. One meg input impedance, 150 ohm output impedance. So it's getting real close there to that 100 ohm spec that I said in the beginning that you really wanna to try to observe as much as possible. This is a great option if you need to have something real small that you can manipulate in different parts of your pedal board. Now to get an input and output buffer, you'd still need two of these. And it's same with the MXR buffer, you'd need to get two of them. But even so, they're so small that if you need to be able to put them in different positions, you need to be able to reroute them in your order. These are really great choices for that because of how small and compact they are and gives you lots of options no matter where you wanna put them in your signal path or where they need to live spatially even if they're coming first and last in your signal chain. Next, we got the Laylee Sunday Driver. Now, I really like what they're doing on this because they're the only company that I've seen that's offering a variable input impedance. And this is why I said that this would work great for guitars or it would work great for bass. They actually have a variable impedance switch on the back, which has an S and a D. In one position, it's a standard one meg input impedance. When you hit the switch again on the S slash D, it then moves it to five meg. So if you have a bass, you can actually switch to the five meg position and you still get the full benefits of controlling that pickup loading the way that you want, in particular with passive basses. And then you have a 220 ohm output impedance. Now this is a little bit higher than the 100 ohm spec that I talked about, but it's still well within a reasonable range where it's gonna be able to drive a long cable and not have too much of a problem. So I really like this. And then you can also compensate with the level on the front because it has a boost control on the front of the Sunday driver. So if you need to make up a little bit of gain or you need to have something that matches different pickup outputs, if you have different types of basses, this can be a great way to do it for that. Or if you got guitar equally, you can set it to one meg and you have that same compensation. You got humbuckers, you got single coils. You can do some of that compensation up to 18 decibels on the Sunday driver. Another reason a bass player might like the Sunday driver from Laylee is there's actually a DI option. And if you engage the DI, you can use a balanced TRS cable and you can go straight to the front of house with it, which is a really cool option for all you bass players out there. 
Lastly, we have one of my favorite buffers, which I, I use all the time, which is the Mesa Boogie High Wire. Now, again, the reason why I love this is that it includes both of the buffers that you would need on your pedal board, the input buffer and the output buffer, and does it at the spec that you want. One meg input on the input output buffer and 150 ohm output. So this is exactly what you need in order to make sure that your signal is as pure as possible and is representing as close to plugging directly into your amplifier, even though you're running through a bunch of different pedals with all different sorts of input and output impedances. Definitely one of the best ones out there, in my opinion. It is a little bit more expensive than some of the other ones that we've talked about, but I think when you do the math and the fact that you would need to get two of these output buffers in order to have an input and an output buffer, you'll see that the value is well worth it and you also get that level compensation so that you can compensate between humbuckers and single coils, plus you have the benefits of an output boost and a tuner mute so you can even remove one more thing out of your signal path by having your tuner be fed by this so it doesn't have to be in line with everything else in your signal path. I think it's a no-brainer, but let's now talk about different contingencies where you may not want to have an input and output buffer as I recommend, and you may want to even have more than an input output buffer if you have an effects loop or you have a stereo system. So let's get into that. So let's first talk about contingencies where you don't need to have an input and an output buffer. One obvious one I can think of is if you have active pickups. An active pickup system puts a preamp on your guitar, and that's essentially like putting a buffer inside of the guitar, so it's starting the buffer just earlier in the chain, so the necessity for an input buffer is not so critical. Now, if you had one, it wouldn't hurt anything, but you probably don't need one, and you could just use an output buffer. So in that case, really any of these would work, and you wouldn't have to go up to the high wire in order to make your rig sound great. You could go with something like the Stowaway, the Sunday Driver, or the MXR buffer. However, the MXR buffer is a little bit higher on the output impedance, I might try to stay more toward the Lely Sunday Driver or the Stowaway if you have the budget available to do that. Another contingency where you may not want to have an input buffer is if you have a wireless system. Using wireless is essentially putting a buffer on the input, and so the need for adding another buffer isn't necessary. Again, if you had a dual buffer like the high wire, it's not going to hurt anything, but if you didn't have the budget for that or you wanted to trim a little off your budget, you'd be just fine going with something like the Sunday driver just on the output at the very end of your system, or something like the stowaway at the very end of your system because those have nice low output impedance, are going to be able to drive those long lines back to your amplifier with little to no change in the tone. So let's now talk about four cable method, using an effects loop out of your amplifier and how many buffers are going to be necessary for that. The really, the only difference of a effects loop amp and a, a typical mono system where you would have an input and output buffer like we've said, is you actually are going to need another buffer on the return. Now the reason why we need a buffer on the return and not the send, for example, is almost every effects loop out there has a buffer on the send. Some of them even have level compensations so that you can adjust whether it's line or instrument level coming back into the pedals. But there aren't very good output impedances on most pedals, and so having a buffer at the end of that, at the return, when you go back to the amplifier, on the pedal board, taking the cable back to the amplifier and connecting it back to the return is a good idea as well, so you can make sure that you're not getting any signal loss in the effects loop part of your system. Now here's another common question is how do you buffer if you're going to use a stereo rig? Well, a stereo rig is essentially going to be like using anything like the Mesa Boogie High Wire. You got your input and you got your output buffer. But instead of having just one output, you're actually gonna have two outputs, right? Because you not only have the left, you'll have the right as well. So in this case, what I would do if I were getting something like the Mesa Boogie High Wire, I would just add something like the stowaway buffer. So you have a second buffer for say the right side of the stereo image, and then you're using the high wire itself for the left side or the mono side of the stereo image. Now you could add any of these other ones as your second output buffer. However, as we talked about before, some of them don't quite match up to that 100 ohm spec on the output impedance, so I would take that into consideration in this particular situation. But another thing that happens when you add an output buffer for a stereo rig, or you just have a stereo rig in general, is you have to then consider isolation. And this is where the P-split that we were talking about earlier comes into effect. This is, in essence, an isolation transformer, which provides galvanic isolation for one of your amplifiers. 
Sometimes, even if both your amps are on the same ground, you can sometimes have issues not only with polarity, which some people call phase, but is actually polarity, and they also have some issues with grounding. So not only does the P-Split allow you to control for both of those things, it has easy to use push button switches so that you can adjust the polarity. And the easiest way to determine if your amp is in the right polarity is you can hit your low E string, just keep droning the low E string and try it in both positions. The one that has more bass is typically the one that is in the proper polarity. Now, an easy way to determine if you have any sort of ground loop situation and you need to use galvanic isolation, you can hit the grounding switch and you'll hear the noise go away. And then when you re-engage it, you'll hear the noise come back. It's an easy way for you to tell. I recommend that you try it both ways so that you have a reference point to what you're comparing against. And you would just use this on one of the outputs of your stereo image. So you would only say, for example, use it on the amplifier on the right side, but not the one that's getting the left feed. And I would recommend putting this as close to the input of the amplifier as possible. Typically, most of the transformers that we see for guitar related stuff are input transformers. So the closer you can get them to the amp, the more effective they'll be able to be in terms of being able to get rid of any of the noise and hum and ground issues that you may be having. Now, another caveat where you may want to consider either not including a buffer in certain positions or moving it into a different position is if you have a fuzz. A lot of the old fuzzes like the fuzz faces and the tone benders are incredibly sensitive to buffers and you don't want to put any sort of input buffer at the beginning of your chain because those pedals want to see a signal right off the guitar. If that's the case and you're using some sort of impedance sensitive device like an old vintage fuzz, what I would recommend doing is putting your input buffer buffer after the fuzz. So you still have the benefits of driving the cable after the fuzz, but you're not going to affect the overall fuzz tone when you engage it. It's going to be able to behave in the way that you're used to and not wreak havoc on those vintage tones by putting a low impedance signal going into the input of it. So that was a nice rundown on buffers. Now, you may still be a little confused at the end of this and we got you covered because your Sweetwater sales engineer has this exact training that I'm delivering to you today and they can help you decide what combination of buffers are gonna be the very best for you and your system so that you're getting the tone that matches up to the same sound you hear when you take your guitar cable and you plug it right into your amplifier even though you're running through a bunch of pedals. They're gonna be able to help you with that so definitely talk to them about your options in terms of using input buffers, output buffers and getting them in the spec that I recommend. Now, if you like the stuff that you saw today Day about buffers, I highly recommend that you like, you subscribe, and you leave a comment. And by subscribing, you're gonna stay up to date with all the cool stuff that Sweetwater is teaching about things like buffers all the time. Until next time, I'm Mason Marangella from Vertex Effects, AKA The Rig Doctor. I'll see you later.